how many times have these art forms given us strength, joy, comfort, escape, and hope in the past few months? Without songs and film, lockdowns will have felt vastly different. Art is resilient. Art makes us resilient. My name is Ernesto Ottoni, and I'm the Assistant Director General for Culture of UNESCO. It is my pleasure to welcome you all as the moderator of today's UN75 UNESCO Resilient Art Dialogue, Music and Film, Rebuilding Better Through COVID-19 and Beyond, organized by the UN Chamber Music Society. Before beginning today's discussion, it is my pleasure to introduce the United Nations Secretary General Advisor on UN75, Mr. Fabrizio Hochschild, and the World Health Organization Art and Health Lead, Mr. Fer Mr. Christopher Bailey, to offer introductory remarks. This year, confronted with the worst global pandemic in 100 years, we mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. We need music and art more than ever. And I would like to really thank the UN Chamber Music Society for hosting this UN75 dialogue in partnership with UNESCO's Resiliart and with leading voices from the music and film industries. We're marking our 75th birthday very differently. Frankly, looking at the state of the world, there's not too much to celebrate. Instead, we want to pause and listen. We want to take a global reality check. We want to hear from the world through dialogues and surveys on how we can better address the most urgent global challenges of our time, like pandemics, climate change, protracted conflict, and growing inequality. COVID-19 crisis has changed our lives, possibly forever, but it has also reminded us just how interconnected our world is and how critical it is for us all to work together to tackle the global challenges we face. It's up to us to decide how well we work together as we come out of this crisis. Your voices are more important now than ever before. There are many ways to have your say. The easiest is through our one-minute survey that anyone anywhere can take and it's available in over 50 languages. You can also hold UN75 Global Dialogues similar to the one we're so honoured to participate in today. The views, concerns and ideas expressed in today's dialogue will be included and presented in a publicly available report to world leaders of all 193 UN member states and senior UN officials. This dialogue will explore how we can chart ways forward, both throughout the COVID-19 crisis and beyond to 2045, to better address global threats and to build the world we want. Culture in all its forms, including music and film, are integral and must be better incorporated in these discussions to build the future we want. Music and film are one of the most socially influential sectors within culture, and this dialogue aims to further engage them in global policy discussions and UN implementation efforts related to the Sustainable Development Goals. I hope that you will enjoy this UN Chamber Music Society dialogue on music and film. As humanity faces its greatest test since the formation of the United Nations in the aftermath of World War II, may this dialogue contribute to the UN75's efforts in the shaping of a new world by 2045, the United Nations centennial. Music is the common language of humanity. Music points the way to rediscovering our common aspirations and hopes for a better future. The UN75 initiative provides the platform to communicate them. Thank you. Uh, if you allow me, we're going to give uh, the floor to Christopher Bailey so he can share the opening remarks. Christopher.
please. Hello, uh, as Ernesto said, my name is Christopher Bailey. I'm the arts and health lead at the World Health Organization. And um, I, uh, I think where I'd like to begin my opening remarks is with the disease itself, COVID-19. Um, WHO is a public health agency. That means we think in terms of populations. And there's a tendency sometimes to forget that populations are made up of people. Uh, I'm gonna begin with a, a very simple story, one that's been replicated uh, uh, thousands and thousands of times around the world, but it's my story. Um, when I was a young man, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts uh, in uh, New York City to, to learn to become an actor. And the stage manager of that school uh, was a guy named David Zipperer. And he stage managed all of my shows as a student actor. And over the years, uh, we kept in contact. And in fact, uh, on Facebook, in, with the emergence of social media, he followed uh, all of his former students over the decades uh, and supporting them in their careers keeping in touch, getting other people in touch together. And in, in my case, uh, as I moved to WHO and uh, started doing artistic and theater uh, events under the UN auspices, whenever I had one in New York, he would always be there. He would always come. When I heard that he was suffering from the symptoms of COVID-19, um, we all became concerned. He was diabetic, he was overweight. And when he checked into the hospital, we all were sending him our, our, our very best thoughts. When he had to go on to a ventilator, we all became concerned. And like so many patients, he got better, he left the hospital, and he had a relapse and died of a stroke. What happened in our community was that this glue in the fabric of our network of friends disappeared. And that fabric threatened to unravel. It left, his loss left a huge rent in, in the tapestry of this network of friendships that goes back decades. I think theater and the arts are all about community, are all about a shared experience, shared emotion. And when even one person dies, that tapestry is threatened. Now at WHO, we've become very much interested in, in using the arts uh, to advance uh, health and perhaps one of the most uh, uh, notable examples was the recent collaboration we did with Global Citizen and Lady Gaga, uh, the Together at Home concert that uh, uh, I think went around the world and uh, was quite successful. Yes, it raised a lot of money, but it did more than that. By bringing performing artists together, we offered comfort. We offered an ability to tell simple stories to get across health messaging to honor the first line workers. We, um, we were able to use song and solidarity to get a sense of togetherness and oneness um, at a time when fears were, were threatening to divide us. And I think the arts in general but in this particular case, the songs that were gathered and curated by Lady Gaga offered an opportunity to use arts as a sense-making device to try and navigate together the uncertainty, the fears, and eventually a common cause and meaning to this global catastrophe that we are all living through. And one unintended benefit of that concert I just found out uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was asked to be part of an online pandemic summit with the Aspen Institute, there was a former head of the FDA there 
who told me that she had been working with um, <clears throat> young students uh, around the country. And there was a huge uptick after that concert of high school students beginning to actively explore careers in public health and science. And that was a totally unintended consequence of this. So at WHO, I think we, we truly believe in the, the health benefits of the arts. Um, and, and that corresponds to our definition of health in the 1947 WHO Constitution, where we believe that health is not only the absence of disease, it is also the attainment of the highest level of physical, mental, and social well-being. And certainly the arts are ideally suited to expand and, and share that social well-being with everyone, regardless of geography, regardless of economic income or political power. Um, I think with this pandemic, We've shown our resiliency by not being able to gather in person because of social distancing, a necessary uh, effort on all of our parts to stop the transmission chain and, and reverse the pandemic. And we've used things like Zoom, even with the technical difficulties uh, in imaginative ways to establish contact with each other. And in particular to people who are isolated and, and maybe feeling anxiety to comfort them, to entertain them, to ennoble each other. But I also wanna say a few words about the loss and the loss of in-person uh, entertainment and performance. There is a difference. And I think the arts have been disproportionately hit by the economic consequences of this lockdown. There are live theater, live opera companies, live orchestras around the world, um, large and small, that are facing extinction from this meteor. And I, I think that I would ask governments to invest in those artistic areas that are reliant on live audiences, not just to preserve them as a vestige of the past, but because they offer a true sense of community. To be physically with somebody is different than being with them virtually on a screen. And, and in this field of study, we've, got, we've actually seen how there is an effect when audiences come together of heartbeats literally beginning to synchronize, of T cell counts going up, of a healing effect happening, and, and the power of the mirror neurons in that empathic moment becoming more acute when it's live people together experiencing the same emotions with the performers in a kind of transcendent communion. So I, I, I hope that music played in the home, music enjoyed in camaraderie, in communion together, uh, won't fade away, but is re-enriched by this experience because being touched is more than just an emotional experience, it is still a physical experience. And for now, yes, we must not touch. We must keep our distance. But let's imagine a day where we can come back and let's make sure that those organizations that are the temple of that kind of transfigurative, transcendent communion are still around and are thriving. Because I think they have a role to play. In, in imagining the future that uh, we, we have an opportunity to create now. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. And we are taking all your words. We are uh, with you in these moments where many of uh, our creators has lost more than uh, livelihoods. They have lost many symbolical and physical issues and uh, 
we wanted also to share with you, sorry for the bug that we had before. It was not a performance. I will tell you, it was a bug. We will try the welcoming message to put it at the end uh, of, uh, of the debate. But right now we have to start. We have uh, our guests and, 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 uh, and our fellow participants uh, who want to share with us. So I will only introduce uh, why we are here. Uh, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has hurt the global economy at a large, a large scale, and the culture and the creative industries have not been spared. In fact, the sector, which heavily relies on physical spaces, as we heard, and shared experience like cinemas, concert, museum, and live performance, has been one of the hardest hit. At some countries, uh, as some countries begin to relax, like in Europe or in Asia, physical distancing restrictions, the culture sector remains largely on pause, risking being forgotten and left behind in this new normal that we are talking about. Despite the growing demand and appetite for cultural content, many of the artists and cultural professionals who create these sounds and images are in an extremely precocious, precarious situation. Oftentimes, they are left without the social or economic safety nets that professionals in other industries enjoy. This is why on April 15, World Art Day, UNESCO launched Resiliart, a global movement that sheds light on the far-reaching ramification on COVID-19 across the cultural sector through open dialogues. During this inauguration, uh, we called on artists and cultural professionals around the world to organize their own resilient debates. Today, I'm delighted to announce that we have reached more than 182 debates that have taken place across all regions of the world. The success of Resilient not only underscored the adversity facing artists, but also their enormous knowledge, innovation, agility, and capacity to mobilize. Uh, Resilient has brought together artists and cultural professionals from over 62 countries, yet they share many common concerns insufficient emergency financial support, difficulty monetizing their work in the digital space, lack of access to health insurance, absence of culture in recovery, the pandemic disproportionate impact on female artists and the lack of access to digital technology, technologies. Across the world, we have seen that the social and economic precariousness of artists is a chronic condition. COVID-19 did not create these vulnerabilities. It's only exposed and worsened them. The current crisis must trigger, trigger efforts to increase the creative sector resilience and serve as a turning point to reshape, rethink the value of this cultural work. Artists, creators, but also institutions need our help today to fight alongside them for the survival of the creative industries and to demand fair remuneration for the creative labor during and beyond the current crisis. As we heard and as we are gonna reflect during this one hour and a half, uh, I would like now, uh, and it's my great pleasure, to introduce our four panelists today who are diverse leaders in the music and film industries. Each panelist will offer their general thoughts and reflection on the impact of COVID-19 before our discussions begin. So I will introduce them one by one. Sean Patrick Flahaven is Chief Theatrical Executive of Concord. Now uh, is the fifth largest music company in the world. Concord Theatrical, Theatricals is the world's most comprehensive license house and publisher. It represents over 10,000 plays and musicals in many iconic and contemporary songwriters and recordings. Concord also developed and produced shows for Broadway, West End, and uh, internationally worldwide. From 
2008 to 2016, Sean was senior vice president of theater and catalog development for Warner Chapel Music, the global music publishing arm of Warner Music Group. He has been uh, a producer on over 30 albums, 12 of which were nominated for Grammy Awards, including the Grammy winning six-time platinum hit Hamilton. He won a Tony Award as a co-producer of the hit uh, 2019 Best Musical, Headstone. Uh, he has produced and managed over 100 of shows, concerts, workshops, and readings for landmark companies and uh, of Broadway shows. So welcome, Shen. You have the floor, please. Thank you, Ernesto. It's an honor to be here, and I'm happy to participate. Uh, I hope everyone who's uh, watching is, is safe and healthy. Um, I've worked in uh, theater and music uh, in New York and around the country and in uh, London for about 25 years. Um, and was a writer and performer and conductor before I became a producer. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so I, I spent the majority of my career talking with artists and working with artists. Um, at Concord, we we're lucky to represent a huge catalog of plays and musicals and songs and recordings um, across many genres and uh, by uh, diverse authors and uh, we have uh, obviously felt, as everyone has, uh, the effects of, of the pandemic. Uh, we've, uh, over 500 of us have been working from home since March. Um, this is the first time I've worn a suit in several months. <laughs> um, but uh, um, obviously, you know, we've had thousands of productions uh, around the world uh, canceled and postponed, uh, not just Broadway and West End and tours, but uh, we license all sorts of productions, schools, universities, community groups, uh, military groups, church groups. Um, and uh, although thankfully most of them are postponed, there have been quite a few that were canceled. Uh, theater people tend to be optimistic. And so they're still planning productions for later this year or next year. Um, but it's uh, severely cut into not just the uh, institutions uh, that are, and, and organizations that produce these shows, but uh, the royalties to the authors, the salaries to the performers and the directors and the musicians and stagehands and everyone involved. The, you know, there's, it's a tip of the iceberg in, in the number of, of people affected by each production. Um, likewise, on the, on the music side, uh, recording and touring has disappeared. Um, I was lucky enough to record two albums in London just before everything shut down. And I really miss being able to, you know, be in a studio with uh, a large orchestra or even a small theater group. Um, and um, so uh, being part of uh, Concord, we're, the theatrical part of it has obviously been severely affected. The recording and music publishing sector has been affected to some extent, but streaming has already been a big part of that. So people are, are listening to music and streaming already. Um, but the transformation of a, as, as Chris said um, earlier, you know, inherently theater is a live experience. It's a live performance experience. It's a live audience experience. And this is a very different transformation. So we've been working very hard to try and bring as many performances online as we can. Um, in some cases, there are rights issues. In some cases, there are um, logistical issues. Um, but uh, it's an ongoing challenge that's evolved over time. And I think the longer that this has lasted, the more we realize that we can't be thinking of this in short-term solutions. We have to think about in medium and long-term solutions as well. Um, not just when things uh, hopefully get back to uh, some state of what they were before, but also in um, how we uh, reach as many people as possible. Very well. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we go to Rose Schwartz. He's a partner of the New York City Entertainment Law Firm of Franklin, Wenrib, Rudel, and Vassallo, and PC Joseph. Her practice involves representation in the field of the performing arts, motion picture, financing and production, television, music, theater, books, and new media. Her clients include U.S. and international film and television producers, authors, opera companies, record labels, and creative 
talent. Rose is also an adjunct professor of law at uh, New York uh, University School of Law, where she has thought, uh, taught uh, entertainment law since uh, uh, 1985. Uh, she has lectured extensively in the United States and in Europe on entertainment law topics and have le developed symposia for business executives and attorney attorneys. She is listed as the New York Metro super lawyer in the field of entertainment and sports. And she was named uh, a top woman in uh, Super Lawyers New York Metro Top Woman 2020 in the entertainment and sports area of practice. Rose, you have the cameras. Thank you so much, Ernesto, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to the group for inviting me to participate uh, on behalf of myself and my firm my law firm, Franklin Weiner, Rudell and Vassallo, in a very important panel discussion with you all. Uh, it's an honor to be with you and it is uh, critical that we all review the issues that we face both near term and far term in the arts uh, with respect to the effects of COVID-19. Uh, the fact that Ernesto and uh, uh, Chris basically said everything that I wanna say means this is gonna be a very short remark. But uh, I think my, my first and urgent belief as a general statement is that culture and the arts are what separate us from other life forms on this planet. They are the bedrock of humanity and they have links to so many important parts of our life agenda, including education, inclusiveness, diversity, sharing public spaces, sharing private emotions. We all know that in times of crisis like this, people turn to the arts for solace, for laughter, for education, and for escape. And the fact that they have come back from past crises to survive and to thrive gives us hope and bodes well for the future. One of the issues that we need to think about, and we can come back to it, I'm sure we will come back to it later, is ensuring that in this strange world of digital content, which we're all learning at this point, uh, that the content is accessible somehow to more than the 50% of the world that has access to the internet. And in some way, and I think the United Nations and uh, Resilia are amazing leaders, that needs to be addressed and somehow uh, satisfied somewhat better. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. I am an entertainment lawyer. I work in a 15-person New York City-based entertainment law boutique. Uh, as Ernesto mentioned, we represent opera companies, Broadway producers, film and television production companies, uh, best-selling authors, directors, and uh, performers. And in the wake of COVID-19, we, we've seen so many of them and their businesses come to an absolute grinding halt. Uh, there are theater companies, as Sean mentioned, that have simply shut down. Um, as I know Emily will talk about, film and television production uh, on projects that were ready to roll or were rolling came to a stop. Uh, and the areas that seem to be moving at this point are these pockets of non-social distancing uh, areas such as documentary production, animation, um, development of new projects, but the actual production world is incredibly quiet. So in addition to thinking about what we need to do for artists uh, who are suffering mightily, I think we also need to keep in mind the collateral damage that this pandemic has wrought on so many things that we love. So not only do we have actors out of work, not only are musicians suffering, but there's also massive damage to tourism, to hotels, to restaurants, to broadcasters, to the retail industry, to everyone who is associated with the arts. And uh, those are also issues that are gonna take a long time to, to return to whatever the new normal is going to be. So I'm going to, in my, in my remarks later on, uh, I'm going to focus on one of my favorite clients, which is the Metropolitan Opera, as a paradigm for my part of the conversation. 
And a little bit of background, uh, in mid-March, uh, when the pandemic was clearly not going away, the Metropolitan Opera closed its doors for safety reasons and um, stopped. <laughs> uh, at the same time, in an effort of what Ernesto was describing, of keeping the arts and culture available, accessible to those of us who were all suffering uh, in, the, in similar ways, the Met began a series of nightly streams of its live and high definition programs, uh, which had been one of the 12 year initiatives that the Met has had of making um, Saturday matinees 10 times a year available to the uh, to movie theaters in 73 countries around the world. Uh, those films which have been transmitted to movie theaters, to television and so on, became part of a free nightly stream every night, different production uh, available at no charge to anyone who wanted to tune in and watch the Met. Uh, that continued and still continues. And in June, when the Metropolitan Opera's uh, gala fundraising event was shut down, uh, they decided to stage a gala. It was called the At Home Gala. Uh, with 40 artists performing in 40 different countries and locations um, and a donate now button which allowed for some revenue to be generated as a result of this free stream by people who wanted to make philanthropic contributions to the Met but no charge was assessed for doing that gala. Now uh, and we were talking about this earlier and I'm sure we will more as we move forward to a world where we need to consider monetization of the arts in order for the organizations that present them and therefore all the people who rely on them, the musicians, the employees and so on, in, a, in an effort to try to move from the free content era that we've seen for the last four months into a world of monetization, the Met just began this past Saturday a series of 12 recitals by major opera luminaries singing from 12 glorious locations, a chateau on the French Riviera, um, a, last week was a, an abbey in Munich, a Baroque Abbey, a, uh, churches in Barcelona, the major opera stars performing popular material for a charge of $20 per person. And the big question of this as we move into this, you know, so-called new realm of charging for content uh, is going to be to see whether or not there is an appetite in the public with so much free content available to actually pay to be able to share in uh, new content that is produced. And it's an important experiment and it's one which is raising many eyebrows at this point of, gee, how, how, how is it possible that you're charging for the ability to see these broadcasts that should be made available for free? And it is a new world that we're entering into where we need to think about, as Ernesto said, the survival of the organizations that provide work for all of the musicians, employees, stagehands, and so on, uh, to be able to continue doing what they do and they do so well. So, that, that's really my focus. And one other, other thing that I wanted to mention, which I'm, I'm sure that Joseph will get into further, is the difference in uh, financing different organizations, arts organizations in the United States as compared to other countries, and the reliance here on corporate and individual funding as opposed to government funding, which is more prevalent in Europe, and how that affects the growth and development and survival of these different organizations. So thank you, and I can't wait for the rest of it. Thank you, Rose. We're going to go uh, to speak after, but right now I want to jump to Joseph Bartning. He, he is the executive director of the Salzburg Festival Society. Uh, Joseph, Joseph has collaborated with a prestigious international board to raise funds and increase engagement with this premier festival of classical music. The Salzburg Festival was one of the first global artistic peace projects uh, uniting countries with their shared appreciation for artistic excellence. Under Joseph's leadership, the society aims to celebrate the festival's rich legacy 
promote peace through strategic partnerships and works to create an, in, an inclusive community of enthusiasts. Most recently, the Society has supported the West Eastern Dive Divan Orchestra that consists of musicians from the Middle East and those with a Spanish background. Joseph is a graduate of the Juilliard School in voice performance. It is great to have you here today, Joseph. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto, for that introduction. And it's an honor to be included in this. You know, I think it gave many artists and audience members around the world hope when president of the Salzburg Festival, Helga Rabestadler, made the announcement that there would be a modified program. In her announcement, she said, coronavirus is the greatest challenge our society has faced since the end of World War II. Never before has cultural life in democratic countries been curtailed so severely in peacetime. The Salzburg Festival was founded at a time of abject misery as a courageous project against the crisis. It was its founder, Max Reinhardt, that was convinced that only the arts could reconcile people, even people whom war had driven into battle against one another. Art, not as decoration, but as food and the meaning of life. It was also actually in World War, after World War II on August 12, 1945, that the American troops led by General Mark Clark, reinstated the festival. There was a hunger for a unifying power of the arts. This is also when the United Nations was founded, as we all know. The world needed these institutions and individuals to inspire a new framework of coexistence and cooperation. Look, I think we all see this impact of this pandemic as a similar call to action, especially for the arts. Artists are resilient and resourceful, and it's their power to inspire and bring together that is most important now. Some of this is happening great with great success virtually, but socially and economically a recovery plan, keeping the arts at the center is essential. As Ernesto and Chris said, artists convey important human values, emotions that help further understand ourselves and our society better. They bring us closer together in solidarity and appreciation for one another. We are all part of this shared humanity and experience, this reality, when attending a concert or the festival for that matter. The idea of the Salzburg Festival was to bring a new order after a spiritual and financial turmoil of the times. It was the five founders that wanted to build a better, more unified world, sustainable and accessible to all. And this is definitely our, our commitment today. And I think it's very reassuring to, to have these conversations that will bring us together because I think we all, very much crave that we're not that what we're not getting in the theaters today. Thank you, Ernesto. Ernesto, I think your microphone is off. Today I will do a lot of performance. Sorry, it's it's the way to put it uh, a little bit lively. Okay, so uh, we go directly to Emily O'Brien. She's the founder and the CEO of Earth Angel, one of the first sustainable, uh, sustainability consultancy dedicated to film and television production, headquartered in New York City. A pioneer of the sustainable filmmaking movement, she has worked with major motion pictures and television series to reduce their environmental impact since 2011. Rec recent clients include the Emmy and Golden Globe winning series, The Marvelous Mrs. Weissel, Maisel, and Steven Spielberg's Oscar nominated film, The Post. Her sustainability leadership on the film set of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 contributed to it be being acclaimed as the eco-friendly blockbuster in Sony Pictures history. Emily is also an inaugural Tory Birch Foundation Fellow Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Alum, and 2018 Inc. Magazine 30, uh, 30 Under 30 Rising Stars. She speaks around the world on the topic of sustainable production. Welcome, Emily. Thank you so much, Ernesto, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to UNESCO and UN Chamber Music Society for hosting this really important discussion and, and um, it's an honor to be among all these esteemed uh, panelists. 
Um, so as Ernesto mentioned, I sort of work in this intersection of entertainment and the environment. Um, and so where COVID is concerned, of course, our industry has come to a grinding halt. Film and television production um, is, uh, has been virtually wiped out, um, although we are starting to see it uh, slowly come back to life in, in certain regions, um, but in a very limited capacity and, and much, much different than it was before. Um, I think if anything, this pandemic has showed us that um, the demand for content is certainly there. Um, I don't know how many of us really would have gotten through quarantine with our, our sanity intact if it weren't for streaming and, and storytelling, um, you know, to be at our fingertips in so many ways. But, um, you know, I think as Christopher mentioned, uh, this, the severity of the situation, you know, this is not just livelihoods lost, um, it's loved ones lost. And I think to Rose's point too, it's also really illuminating the fragility of the ecosystems that support this sector. Um, and I think, for example, you know, my friends who work in uh, lighting and camera rental house companies or um, catering and craft service companies, the, the film and television industry exists. You know, we have many corporate studios, of course, um, who, who create a lot of this content in the United States, but it's supported and, and the backbone of, of it are these small businesses. Um, and of course the, the cast and crew um, really make up uh, the framework. And so what I've thought has been uh, especially sort of heartening, I think in the wake of the pandemic is that um, our industry is very good at emergency response. And I've seen friends of mine who are prop makers or custom fabricators completely shift from making custom sets and scenery to fabricating uh, PPE for, you know, our, our New York frontline workers during the peak of the pandemic. Um, and even our catering companies shift to uh, supporting and, and feeding frontline workers in, in the absence of our production going down. So that, that swell of community, I think, is really significant um, and I think is, is a really important piece of, of, you know, what makes our industry special and, and, um, a, a, and such a big part of this. Uh, and so certainly our big question now is um, not making sure that we don't roll back on those sustainability efforts that we've worked so hard to embed in the production process. Um, a lot of the new health and safety protocols, um, you know, in a way sort of counter what some of that progress has been, whether that's, you know, emphasizing single use items or um, encouraging people to uh, drive to work instead of take public transit. So we're at this really interesting precipice where we sort of have to balance both. Um, and on top of that, of course, the United States is sort of having this uh, social and racial justice uh, reckoning, which I think all of these things coinciding, I don't think is a coincidence. I think that, you know, this is really an indication that, um, you know, the, the fragility of these systems is really being exposed as, as you put it, Ernesto. Um, and what I really like to um, go back to, which gives me a lot of hope and optimism, um, is this really great quote by uh, Tony Cade Bambara, who's an African-American author, documentary filmmaker and activist, which is, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. And so I think that that is true more than ever and that we have a real opportunity here um, to obviously protect the, the arts and entertainment industry and, and, um, and also leverage it to, to really propel us into a, a uh, more socially just, a more environmentally just um, you know, new world that we'll be entering. Yes, that's great to hear it because I, I oh, yes, we share this, this uh, point of view that something has to change. What we are living right now is only uh, the explosion of many things that were underground, but it was there. Right now we have to, to reflect about how we're going to change and how everybody in the ecosystem of the culture sector can contribute so that police, uh, policymakers can take decisions, but we have to build the decisions together. We cannot allow not to participate in the solutions. We should be part of the discussion and that 
why it's so important to have these dialogue, debates, movement around the world, so that we can see that for the first time, it's really global. Every institution is affected. You have to know that uh, of the 95,000 museums that exist in the world, there is ECOM, the International Council of Museums, who is sharing with us the possibility that 12 or 13 percent of this institution will not be able to reopen if you if we leave the institution and it's also only museum and we don't do something we're gonna lose diversity and culture without diversity doesn't exist so please that's great to hear all of you once again uh thank you uh, to all our panelists for agreeing to take part in this UN 75 Brasilia discussion. And without further ado, let's jump into our discussion with these extraordinary panelists. Um, I would like also to invite the audiences to post any questions you may have in the chat. If we, at the end, we don't uh, have so much time to the question and answer, we will take all these questions and uh, UNESCO will give you answers and do the follow-up, okay? I will now address questions to individual panelists and I ask all our panelists to please feel free to share comments or reflection on other speakers' response very shortly, but please use, use it. The, and um, the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affect artists as the vast majority of them are without health insurance, are economically vulnerable and dependent on a secondary source of income. I want to ask first, Sean, your career has spanned various uh, cultural institutions and fields and you work closely with artists. Having witnessed the devastation that the cultural sector has suffered due to the current health crisis, what types of support system are needed to protect creators and provide them with a safety net? What can the public do to support the musician whose livelihoods have been decimated in many cases? Sure. Uh, well, as, as Emily and, and others have said, artists are resilient. Uh, they're used to being in a highly competitive, very um, unsure employment environment most of the time. Uh, but in this case, uh, they're left without um, much of a safety net in general, whether that's uh, the ability to have a, a, a day job or survival job, um, because most of the things that they've been able to do, the professions they've been able to engage in in those cases are um, that have the flexibility of hours that they need are things that are also shut down, like bars and restaurants and stores and other places. Um, so I think we need, there, there are a couple of things. There's, there's the individuals, which includes the artists and all the support people who help make the art, and then there's also the institutions. I think from the, uh, from the individual point of view, we have to not think of the arts, whether it's a commercial thing like Broadway or whether it's a, um, a nonprofit or community driven group or school group, um, to think of those as an extra. They're not an extra. They're obviously essential to not only our sanity and our culture, but, um, but in, in, in living a full life. And so we need to think of those employees uh, as, as part of whatever broader efforts are made by governments. Um, I think in New York, uh, the, the state and the city government generally do a wonderful job of supporting the arts, but obviously they are decimated by having lower tax revenue lately because the businesses aren't open, people aren't working. Um, so they're in a, they've had extraordinary spending on public health issues, which is understandable. And so, uh, you know, we definitely need a, a concerted ongoing federal response in the US. I think we in the UK, we, uh, they've shown signs of, and, and in the EU, they've recently shown signs of having these larger bailout things in the, or support systems. Obviously the, the social network for, or social services network in Europe and the UK um, is more robust than it is here in terms of unemployment and 
uh, health insurance coverage and those sorts of things. Um, so I think we, we need something similar overall to support that just on a basic level, you know, keep people housed and fed and uh, access to healthcare, uh, especially in this situation. Um, and, and bailout is actually the wrong word. It's because that implies that somebody did something wrong. People aren't doing anything wrong here. They're, we're all victims of the same circumstance. Um, and it's also important to include in those discussions freelance employees or freelance artists, because if in some cases, if they haven't had a history of tax payment in some countries, they're not going to be eligible for some of these funds. And so particularly for writers and musicians and individual craftspeople who are paid or either small businesses or are paid as independent contractors, they're not going to have access to those plans. So th that needs to be taken into account. Um, I think the, on the institutional side, as my current job has expanded into other territories in the world, uh, it's been interesting to learn about uh, the different varying levels of both philanthropic support, whether it be corporations or individuals, as Rose said, or government support. You know, in Europe, you have much higher levels of government support for a lot of the state theaters and other places that are starting to reopen, say, in Germany and, um, and other places. In the UK, I think there's, a, there's an American perception that they have a similar system. And the reality is it's just not true. They have uh, very minimal government support overall. They have more than we do, but it's more overall. And, um, and they do not have a tradition of philanthropic giving the way that we do in the US. So if there is no ticket income, that's why you see all these institutions saying, not only are we shut down, we're going bankrupt because we can't pay the rent. We don't have a cash cushion. We don't have an endowment because that's not the way that they operate. So I think there has to be some support of that, some relief, whether a, a larger government program in each territory of rent relief or utility relief, some basic, you know, in this, in the, in the um, support of individuals, obviously the, the administrative staff is important as well to keep the institutions running, as Rose said, because otherwise these are not an imaginary situation where they have a pile of cash that they're sitting on and hiding from everyone. These are employers in the same way that a restaurant or a store or a factory or what have you uh, are employers. So uh, I think those are the, the biggest concerns. Um, the, the, the stimulation of it, it there's, there's sort of a baseline support. And then I think um, the, the way to get around the, 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 the psychic barrier that some um, countries have is that we don't want to be seen as supporting an individual artistic endeavor. Then it becomes somebody judging whether that each individual endeavor is worthy of support. We need to support the entire sector. We need to support uh, commercial production, nonprofit production, and uh, schools and universities and community groups that are keeping this alive. Um, and, and when we're able to gather again, keeping us sane. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Emily, your firm, Earth Angel, is dedicated to working with film and television production on sustainability. During the crisis, filming has largely come to a halt, affecting the livelihoods of thousands of professionals. From your experience, what kind of policy measures or mechanisms are needed or should have been put in place to provide adequate support to the film industry and its related ecosystems? Yeah, so I think one advantage that the United States has in, in terms of the entertainment workforce is that we do have uh, very strong unions and guilds. Um, and so they are a very powerful stakeholder and, uh, and have been advocating for the rights of entertainment workers here for years. Um, and so right now there is a lot of discussion and back and forth among these various stakeholders around what uh, return to work guidelines will look like and what will happen. Um, but a lot of these workers have been, you know, out of work now since March and the, the very limited, um, you know, support that they're getting from the federal government uh, is just not going to really, you know, be able to fill these gaps of, of you know, the, the economic distress that, that they're feeling and that they're experiencing. Um, but of course, we wanna make sure that we come back safely, right? We can't rush and 
uh, and potentially expose people um, in a way that you know it creates hazardous work conditions. So that those debates are still ongoing, and and we're we're still not sure. Um, our real objective, though, right now is that in it's it's very rare that uh, industries get the opportunity to like rewrite guidelines. That that doesn't happen very often, right? <laughs> and so right now we're experiencing that. And I think that there is an opportunity to actually embed, you know, not only the, the health, safety, job security standards that are absolutely necessary, um, but also the environmental standards that should have been in place, you know, all, all along and, um, you know, have been challenging for, for this industry to adapt. Um, in addition to the diversity and inclusion issues as well. Um, I think those are, are certainly top of mind and, and have to be addressed um, here too. So I, I really look at this as an opportunity to say, you know, hey, how can we, we, we have this, the, you know, rework of guidelines um, at the table right now. How can we actually raise the standards, raise the bar to, so that we come back even more progressive, even more, uh, you know, cohesive as a community than, than, than we were previously. Um, and so that's what we're really trying to communicate and leverage right now. I'll say another big challenge for us is that uh, whereas other sectors sort of have this lever of consumer demand that they can pull to try to make uh, industries more more diverse or um, more sustainable. Um, we don't really have that lever to pull, right? Like, not we're not going to have audiences choosing to watch a film or a television series because it was produced sustainably uh, necessarily. And so we have to figure out um, what are other you know the audience stakeholder isn't really a stakeholder we can use to motivate our sector in this regard. What what are other stakeholders that we can motivate? Whether that's our film offices and commissions, which I know in Europe have been really stepping up to promote uh, sustainable production um, in, in many European regions, uh, whether that's trade associations, uh, et cetera. So um, I, I think it's, it's, it's really about, okay, there's a lot on the table right now. Um, let's, let's look at it all. Let's, let's take some of these things that were maybe on the back burner before, let's put them front burner and, and really strategize about you know, a, a holistic solution to a lot of these issues that have, that have plagued the industry for decades. Thank you, Emily. Um, now I will, I will ask a, one question for, for Rose and Joseph. Uh, during the lo lockdown period that some of you are quite right now living, uh, musicians and performing artists around the world have, have had to cancel their tours and performance, as we heard before, to respect physical distancing measures. How many musicians uh, or performers who really heavily, uh, who rely heavily on the use of physical space and experience as source of income been affected by this crisis? What measures have been put in place to help and how are they adapting? It's also the questioning about the institution, how they can get with these artists and can help them. I don't know if Rose wants to answer first or Joseph, you have sure, to- Why don't you take it? Joseph, you have to, the micro. Got it. So um, I think the festival is in a unique position because it's able to actually have a modified program and still work within a, a budget that is, is substantial to actually help artists. You know, the, the budget was 68 million euros, now it's 41 million. And so they've actually been able to, to keep it balanced because they were able to modify the program. But it, it, it also means that there are a lot of artists that are gonna be without work and a lot of things that are postponed. Um, I think the status of the program, it took a while for, for the, president of the festival to make that announcement because she wanted to make sure that health and safety was first. And so that took time. And I think now they've created a very courageous plan. All artists will be tested and placed in three groups. And, and, and so this is a, a bit of an experiment as well, as you mentioned, each group's going to have its detailed safety measures and contact logs will be part of daily life for all artists. So It'll be very interesting how to see how this happens. Audience members will have to wear masks. Um, they'll be seated in a chessboard arrangement and tickets will include names for contact tracing purposes. 
there is also not going to be any intermission. So I think this will be interesting because they didn't want to increase the contact with people. And so it's a very comprehensive plan that I think could potentially, their hope is that it could become a standard for how other festivals and concert, concert halls around the world can maybe a, a, adapt it as well. Uh, you know, though Austria has been lucky, they've kept low COVID numbers. I think this is what's enabled them to stay on course. Uh, but the pro biggest challenge right now is that instead of 240,000 tickets, they can sell 80,000. And going back to your point about um, the budget, a, a good percentage, 45% comes from ticket sales. So this is going to have an impact for sure. Um, what they're really focusing also is on recording and broadcasting all the performances that they can. Uh, making opening up the access for these productions and, and concerts. Uh, I think it's interesting because philanthropy has, on our side, has stayed still strong to, to support the festival this year. Uh, of course, this is a short-term issue for, for them um, in, in, in some ways, uh, but I think it's going to call upon philanthropy even more going forward with all these extra measures. And, especially in the U.S. I think, it, like you've all said, it's a very different system and approach, but it's really an opportunity for especially the U.S. At, to, to learn a little bit from Europe in this way to um, prioritize the arts and, and know that it's a, it's a way for society to also come closer together. Yes. Rose, you want to take the floor? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, th I think Joseph said a great deal that is absolutely right. Um, I think in terms of looking towards a future, uh, and this picks up on a couple of uh, comments that Chris and Ernesto, you made earlier, uh, I don't think that this current time that we're facing uh, is going to be something which allows the beauty and benefit of live performances to be replaced. I think we're going to have to find different ways to address the issues that we're seeing here but there is something about a live performance, just as there is in sports or in so many other areas. You can watch a baseball game on television and it's great. You can watch the whole Yankee season on television and it's great, but nothing replaces the beauty of being in the stadium or in the concert hall or in the opera house or in the theater, watching a performance, being interacting with the performers, feeling their high notes and their low notes, it is incomparable and is part of our civilization. So I think uh, that that will rebound. I'm not quite sure how. We've also seen over the last 10 or 15 years a shift uh, in terms of the economic priorities to the point where right now in the music um, arena, it is touring, it is live concerts that are the uh, bread and butter uh, and record deals and the like are much less uh, the supporting uh, are, are much less the supporting uh, glue that keeps a musician or a recording artist alive. Uh, in effect, there's been a, a shift, at least that I've seen, and I don't know if Sean and Joseph are going to agree, uh, but where it used to be the record company would underwrite a tour. Right now, it's the record company hoping that there's a tour because that gives them the access and the ability to promote and sell their records. So there's been a shift on that front. And again, it is live performances that will be driving the ship going forward. And with live performances, everyone will begin to be paid. The education that I think we need to see, though, is working with the public. Um, I, I totally agree with all of you in terms of uh, philanthropy and trying to enhance government support. Uh, and as you were talking, I was thinking, gee, you know, why can't the WPA, the Work Projects Administration model work here? Why can't there be uh, government support of the arts in a way that there is not in this country and presumably abroad, but I'm not being political. Um, but, it, you know, in, in addition, uh, I, I think that we really need to be training the public uh, that this is not free. You are not entitled to free music. You are not entitled to have a free concert. There is an obligation to support the arts as an individual ticket buying member of the public, an individual signing up for whatever 
service, pay service they want to use, but there is an obligation on the public to contribute towards the artistry and the growth and, and development of new artistic projects. So. Yes, you're right. You're, you're right. Artists have rights also, and they have to be fairly remunerated for the creation that they are putting to the society. Uh, thank you, dear panelists, for, for your insight. Let, let's now shift our focus to arguably one of the biggest impact that you were talking about uh, that has uh, had on the sector, the cultural sector. The digital transition. COVID-19 has further accelerated and solidified music and film transition to the digital space. So to all of you, you can uh, start whoever wants. We will get straight to the point. In a nutshell, what does the shift to digital mean for live music industries and cinema? And what does it mean for those with limited or no internet access? And we have to, 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 to share with the audiences that in the last measurements that we have in UN organizations, 50% of the world has no access to internet in this particular moment. So we are talking of the half of the world who has access. So the question, who wants to start? Sean, Joseph, Emily, Rose, you have the floor. Sean, please. Okay. Uh, no, the, the internet access issue is, is not just also in places that we think of as being remote. Um, I live in, uh, in Westchester County, north of New York City, and uh, my children, like everybody else's, have had to transition to online learning for uh, a big chunk of the school year. And we live in a community that is um, uh, not only uh, uh, ethnically diverse, but socioeconomically diverse. And uh, uh, quite a few of the children did not have access at home to broadband internet. Uh, the school would give them a laptop to use at home for free, um, but they, they didn't have access to that. So, um, so it's a reality in, in many places. Um, I, think, uh, I think the only way to transform that is to have uh, national governments and, and maybe huge foundations, uh, I don't know, or Gates or Bezos or something, that would fund those kinds of things in the same way you would for, uh, obviously not exactly on the same priority level, but on, on water, clean water and other things. So that um, there's a priority for that. It's not just that they can access uh, the arts or entertainment, it's that they can access education and, and other things and exposure to the wider world. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a big issue. Um, the, the, the monetization that you were talking about earlier of uh, that, that Rose was talking about of transitioning from these, let's go to our archives and find things that we can put out there. We've done that as well with, uh, we own the Rogers and Hammerstein catalog. So we've been putting out these free streams of different sound of music and different movies uh, for people to watch, um, which we can do for a certain amount of time, but then eventually you run out of things for people to watch, uh, just like you know, it's the jokes about people finishing Netflix, um, and so uh, so that um, uh, you have to get people used to paying for it. Whether they're whether the public is going to be willing to pay the same price for a, a stream performance as they would for uh, a ticket to a major institutional performance like the Met Opera or Broadway or anything else, I think remains to be seen. Um, and we can't only rely on, um, on the people who can afford to do that, right? Um, I think there's an opportunity here, as Emily was saying, about changing the conceptualization of these things and these paradigms so that perhaps we do have ways to sell tickets on a wider price range so that people who can, you know, and, and we can test as to whether there would be more interest in access to that if people at least have broadband internet, if they're willing to pay $20 and not 150 or $500. Um, but I think there has to be, we have to regard that as an infrastructure issue. Uh, I think we have to uh, think about the economic model of the stream um, in terms of both how does it 
support, you know, in what way is it revenue replacement, right? I don't, I don't think many of us uh, who, who either run institutions or work with institutions, the institutions aren't thinking, oh, I'm going to make so much extra money if I could sell 10,000 streams to this performance where I could normally only sell 500 tickets in a theater. That's not really the way they're thinking. The way they're thinking is, I really hope I can get the 500 people who would normally be here in person to participate in this in some way. Um, and that revenue drives many things. It keeps the employment going and it keeps the, uh, the writers in a royalty stream because the writers aren't getting paid upfront on these things. Um, it's, getting, uh, it's getting the artists paid in some proportion. So I think um, the, the work of, um, in, in some countries, unions and guilds, in some countries, um, institutional, uh, uh, the, the, the institutional producers or the local collection societies or what have you to think about how we fairly compensate these artists and writers and other people involved proportionally to the revenue that's coming in. And Who wants I, to share? I'm oh, sorry. 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 Oh, just, just one more th very quick thought. Um, you know, we also have to think about the, as some people have raised uh, in recent months, that you have these large technology companies who are, um, who are, you know, essentially a conduit for content that they sometimes pay for and sometimes don't. Um, but uh, the legislation that's been, at least in the US recently, regarding fair compensation for the artists and the songwriters for music streaming has been a big issue. So, and that was pre-COVID um, and has been going on for years. So fair compensation by the tech companies who are delivering this content, for lack of a better word, but art, um, and music uh, to the the creators of that. Yes, Rose, you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I completely agree with Sean. Um, you know, I, I think one thing to keep in mind as we learn about what the, the road is going to be forward um, is, and I, I was thinking there was an article today about Erica Badu. Badu I don't know if anybody read it in the New York Times. Uh, who has set up her own streaming service where she's doing uh, COVID, whatever, uh, what are they, the quarantine concert series, uh, which she began doing to, again, try to replace the lost revenue that she had from participating in concerts uh, and is charging a dollar or two dollars or whatever going forward. Um, so every, everyone is searching for their model. But I think you know, one thing to keep in mind, again, is in terms of fairly compensating the artist, the organization that produced the content um, and everyone associated with it, when you are in a world of giving away free streams, free content, there is no revenue for the organization to pay the participants. So again, if it's whether it's the Metropolitan Opera or whether it is um, you know, the Rodgers and Hammerstein productions, if there is free content because people need it, they want it, there is a desire to share, free content has a drawback, which is it means there's no revenue to participate, uh, for, you know, for musicians or creators to participate in. So I think that's an important area to think about. Um, you know, one, one other area which isn't directly on point that I was um, wondering if we were going to talk about is the whole copyright protection concept as a universal concept as opposed to US or EU. And it is one way of ensuring it's not a direct monetary uh, situation, but in countries where there is little or no copyright protection, that is where artists have lost the ability to uh, participate in revenues, whether it's from streaming or any other source uh, from the exploitation of their works. And again, it may be one of the um, tag-alongs that comes from COVID that we all learn and develop. But I think it's an, an important area to keep in mind as we think about protecting artists and protecting creators and uh, you know, producers and creators of creative content. Y yes, very well. Um, I had a question Joseph. for Rose. Yes. Um, Rose, have... Have you noticed that this free streaming has uh, brought in a new generation? Has it engaged them further or is that just an, a, a thought? It's really hard to say. I, th I think it has 
to a certain degree. Uh, and again, a lot of it is, you know, more word of mouth than anything, um, you know, intelligent. Uh, but there are people who have never listened to opera before, who have never listened to, you know, the, the sort of content that the Med is streaming or that our other clients are streaming, who say, hey, it cost me nothing, let me see, that's interesting, I will give it a shot and have become interested and will, yeah, I listened again and that bohem, that bohem thing was really good. Uh, yeah, I, I had somebody call up and say, you know, bohem is amazing. I'm like, what? Bohem is so beautiful. I'm like, oh, <laughs> Love God, <boheme>. uh, <laughs> but, but I think there is some growth and some education and some development, which is through the free streams, which is also through all of our organizations, the performing arts organizations, educational outreach efforts, which, you know, again, the Met has a whole educational area, both in New York City and in hundreds of schools around the country. I am sure that uh, Salzburg does as well. Uh, and it's, it's something that we are trying to develop, which is the next generation of viewers that's less COVID related than, you know, a general issue of, you know, does it help or not? But uh, that's one area. The other area is philanthropic. And again, the free streams for many of these organizations have the please donate uh, click through button, which has resulted in some revenue, but certainly not enough to keep any of them, uh, any of the organizations going. Yes. If you allow me, we're going to jump a little bit because now the digital transition may well be one of the long lasting impacts that the current crisis will leave on the creative sector. And I think that it's our responsibility as, as, as uh, leaders or participants or workers of the arts to try to ensure that this serves as a turning point for the better, for greater access to culture, as you said, among all citizens and for the improved livelihoods of creators. I would like now to invite uh, everyone to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. As you may have seen on the news, the United Nations leading environment and health agency have made a direct connection between env environmental and social degradation and pandemics, including COVID-19. COVID-19 has also exposed inequalities in societies at large especially based on gender and race. And the inequalities are also reflected in the cultural sector. The economic crisis triggered by COVID-19 is exacerbating pre-existing inequalities. The culture and creative industries are not exempt from this trend. In fact, as we discussed earlier, artists represent one of the most vulnerable groups of working professionals, as they often lack uh, so social safety nets. So, Emily, if you allow me, you run a leading sustainability, sustainability consultancy firm. How can the music and film industry play their part to mitigate future environmental and health crises? In other, in other words, how can film industry, for example, or music be part of solution uh, to these global challenges? Absolutely. So our message before pandemic is the same as it is now, um, which is that the creative sector has had and still has an enormous role to play in this fight against climate change, against injustice, and in this recovery period. Um, and I think there are really two primary ways that uh, we in the film and television sector uh, can rise to the occasion of these global challenges. Um, and those are content and practice. Um, so first and foremost, we need to amplify voices uh, of diverse storytellers. Um, and we need to depict more solutions on the screen as well. Um, because when we see that on screen, we help reinforce that a problem exists, like a, a climate solution, for example. Um, we're acknowledging that that's a problem, which in many parts of the world, people still have not recognize that problem. Um, and then also it helps imagine, it helps people to imagine that another future is possible. Um, and that really motivates and incites change. Um, but then on the other side of it, you know, there's, there's, we have to practice what we preach. Um, and so we need to be an example of sustainable industry. We need to get to net zero emissions and we need to show how the physical production of content can be made without exploiting people and without exploiting the planet. 
Um, and there's a term I like to use a lot when I sort of describe this phenomenon, um, which is cinematic immunity. And I think this is sort of like a psychological trend that exists a lot in, in the film and television sector. You have people who really sort of believe that they are immune to what's happening around the world or that they are above the rules because their art is sort of held in in this high regard and it sort of is is the end all be all um and i think that what this is showing us is that you know we are not immune to global crisis to global crises right we are we are experiencing it in the same way everyone else is um, we're not above the rules either. We have an impact. We have to acknowledge that we have an impact and we have to do something about it. Um, and so what I'm really interested in, in, you know, doing in this period of recovery is, you know, let's build upon the foundation that a lot of uh, our industry has already laid. You know, we have corporate studios who have created great sustainability protocols, um, trade associations who have their green committees. Um, but what we need to do is we need to better mobilize action. Um, and that's really at, at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish at Earth Angel. It's to sort of merge the policy and the practice to, to accelerate change. Um, and what we find often in you know, social justice communities, right, is that the people closest to the problem have the greatest capacity to solve the problem. So the more we engage with our community, um, I know we have amazing solutions that we have yet to unlock or stories that just have not had the opportunity to be told. Um, and we have to really actively shift that, that paradigm. Um, and so, you know, uh, the, the thing that I always tell our community when I give talks or presentations is that, you know, we make it snow in the summer. Um, we execute these extreme stunts and car chase sequences. And we, we basically make the impossible possible every day uh, in, in the film and television world. And um, so I know we have the capacity to do that. So we definitely have the capacity to produce our content sustainably um, and produce sustainable content. You know, we, we can absolutely do this if we set our mind to it. That's great. Can I? Yep. I, wa yep. I want to. Yes, I, Rose, I please. Something? Sorry to interrupt, but I've no, been no, no. thinking as, as you've all been talking. Uh, I want to put out a thought, or I don't know if it's a challenge, but as you've all been describing the situation, the United Nations and UNESCO are in a unique position to pull together culture, stories, uh, amazing experiences educational learning, what you were describing before, Ernesto, about kings and queens, local culture. What about the United Nations, UNESCO, whatever the right division is, putting together a new production unit that develops stories based on the United Nations and engages or works with corporations to engage writers, talent, to shoot documentaries, short features, and see about finding a documentary production company to work with and tell your story on a broader uh, entertainment basis. I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be quiet now, but you have such incredible depth of knowledge, of international reach, of storytelling that you could share, and the entertainment community, television, film, music is the way to reach people on the broadest possible basis. So don't, don't let it go to waste. They're, they're great stories. <laughs> it's true. My dear fellows, the time is flying. You cannot imagine how uh, late we are in, in all the, the, the scenario that we build. But it's so interesting how you are sharing your experience and how you are reflecting about how we're going to go through this crisis. But if you can be very uh, concise, I, I wanted to ask in the, in the same uh, questioning uh, on Joseph, what will more envir environmentally sustainable festival look like in the post-COVID world, if you had to imagine? Joseph. Yes, thank you, Ernesto. You know, I want to take it from um, Peter Sellers' keynote speech last year at the Salzburg Festival, because I think it's very appropriate, but I'm condensing it substantially. You, if you want the full speech, you can go on the festival site and read it. But I think, that, and for those of you who don't know Peter Sellers, he's a very incredible American theater director um, that he does opera theater and he's a fascinating human being.
But he took this Mozart opera, the Idomeneo, for, who, when, he, when Mozart composed it at 24 years old, and he connected it to the ocean and climate change. And this is one example how the arts and institutions can you know, serve as voices for some of, the, some of these most pressing humanitarian needs. Uh, it, and so it can also be done by commissioning new works or letting directors have this creative license. So in this speech, he, um, again, he goes back to talking about the role of music and opera as the experiential art form. And I think we all are on the same page that the live will come back. It's just a matter of what form and we all need it. So, but the, the theaters and cities are, are uh, city backdrops create this sacred space, um, potentially acknowledging our past, reflecting on our present and, and hopefully and looking towards the brighter future a harmonious, harmonious future through the arts. That's great. Um, I'm just getting to, okay, so then, so the three points I wanted to share, because you asked about the future of a sustainable festival. In our first step of awareness, we must acknowledge that we are not separate from the environment or anything in the natural world. Our solutions are human and involve compassion, courage, and creativity, the human capacity to take on great challenges and the human capacity to reject greed, unfairness, and injustice. And finally, it is now time to welcome a new generation of creators, activists, repairers, restorers, and healers. And I think this is really enlightening and something that would, should be carried to the future idea of a, a festival, sustainable fe festival. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Sean, uh, can you help us? What kind of gaps have you wit witnessed in terms of supporting artists' careers and livelihoods? Right now, in general, but right now, how do you think music and film can become more representative of what's happening in our society with inclusion, equality, and dignity? Yeah, uh, it's something that we talk about a lot, and especially in the last few months, um, both in terms of COVID and, and also Black Lives Matter and, and other uh, movements. I think um, we think about it in a number of different ways. One is um, to the extent that we as a publisher or a licensor is a gatekeeper, what works are we choosing to represent? Are we choosing to represent works that, that uh, come from a, a wide range of voices and a wide range of, of places and kinds of stories? Um, how are we promoting that work? Um, how are we dealing with uh, work, the older work that may come from a different era and have uh, challenging elements to it, um, and uh, and also just thinking about how we, um, in, when we interact with producers of, of theater, uh, encouraging them to look at a wider range of work than they might otherwise have done. Um, in, uh, in some territories or some parts of the U.S., there are places that think about doing, well, we're going to do a season of these kinds of works and we're gonna have one slot for something new or we're gonna have one slot for a playwright of color or something of the kind. And, um, and so we've, we, we continually have dialogue with them to encourage them to look at a broader range of work that they're producing, which of course results in um, those stories being told to a different group of people than they may have otherwise encountered, uh, different casting than they might otherwise have engaged in. Um, and, and I think, you know, even for uh, commercial works, uh, you know, there's a, there's a thought that um, commercial theater tends to be the same thing over and over again, but the really successful works have often been the most original things. And I was fortunate to work on Hamilton from the, nearly the beginning and, um, you know, trying to tell people that a musical about the first treasury secretary of the United States was going to uh, do really well uh, was not an easy sell until people nope. actually heard it. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, and actually, you know, that, that piece, uh, which now everyone can see on streaming, um, was not only about uh, the, 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 right, the combination of hip hop and history, but also casting uh, in a wildly different way and representation and other things. And it just starts a dialogue. It doesn't mean that these are these are works that have to be put on a pedestal. It's something that creates that dialogue. And so, um, and that's not the only piece. There are, there are many pieces that are like that. Um, but the, the, th the way we try and, and uh, promote them to producers is to think about, 
you know, you don't don't underestimate your audience. Don't under don't don't assume that they only want a certain kind of thing, um, because they may not have ever been exposed to that other thing. And that could be work by people who don't look like them, or it could be work by people from entirely different places. Um, and and then uh, you know we think about an employment practice ourselves. You know where are we looking to make sure that uh, you know our interns are paid because it, it uh, unpaid internships, which is a the bane of the the theater, film, and music world for years. I had to do many of them myself, but it presumes that you can afford to live in a place like New York or Los Angeles or London or someplace that's very expensive, and that narrows the field. And so. You know, we think about uh, casting a wider net, particularly for entry-level positions to uh, places, uh, uh, applicants and, and institution, educational institutions that don't normally feed the uh, entertainment business. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process. We certainly have not solved it or, or conquered it, but we do think about it. Um, and I think we, um, I think that it's a, it is a chance now to be more aware of these things as we go along and how we're thinking, how we're approaching, um, you know, even environmentally, uh, unfortunately, we still, our business is still reliant on paper uh, for scripts and scores a lot, but we use recycled paper. We have all the materials recycled when they're done. Um, and, uh, and we are trying to get every possible digital delivery system available. So if somebody wants to do that, it becomes a lot more environmentally friendly in that way. I have some solutions for you, Sean. We should powwow after this. Okay, great. That's that's great. But you're 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 right. Uh, those who we have uh, children that has been uh, homeschooling during this confinement period, I can tell you that it's very difficult to be environmentally sustainable when the schools are asking to print every pages, uh, and when you have three girls, as is my case, I will not tell you how many. Uh, uh, I don't know how it is called, but big file of paper we had to use to after trash it uh, in the in the in the corbeil, as we say in French. So please, we have to rethink the way that we are doing this uh, this issue uh, of school education at home. I will go to Rose, but first of all, I wanted to share with the with the audiences that uh, every panelist has accepted to extend a little bit these, uh, these uh, Resilia debates. So thank you so much because it's very interesting how you are talking about issues that go beyond the crisis. And somehow it will be part also of the solution that we have to, to, to construct all together to go through not only this crisis, but the many crises that will come because we know that uh, we have to be prepared, we have to be resilient, we have to, to, to work on, on what is uh, the preparedness of what could came, come in the future. So right now, Rose, a question for you. Uh, your practice uh, represents clients in film, television, music, and in your opinion, what can the music and film industry uh, do to create a more equitable and representative system? What do you imagine that could be uh, together towards greater economic, social, and environmental sustainability? I, I think we've covered a number of those issues yes. uh, in terms of trying to achieve diversity, trying to achieve uh, all of the uh, goals that the movements that we've seen springing up uh, have supported. Uh, the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, gender equality, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think really one major issue is going to be how if, and I know I'm not allowed to be political, uh, how if, if there is a way to uh, foster government, federal governmental support in a, at least in this country, in a much, much more meaningful way than has been the case, uh, certainly in, in my lifetime. Uh, and watching what is going on now, where you're talking about how do you support artists, how do the musicians who have no savings get paid, and for them to be getting their $1,200 check or their $600 check uh, for three months, and then being left with no nowhere to go to practice their craft, puts us into a position of really looking to uh, more than philanthropy, more than local government, 
uh, to try to support the, the crisis and to support those in need. Uh, I also think, as you're saying, Ernesto, there are longer term issues that have been bubbling uh, for um, years that do need, that do come to light now and that do need greater protection, copyright being, you know, high among them. Um, and I, th I think it's also a question of what you're doing here, which is making all of us think in a more creative way uh, about how to find solutions and not to say it's their problem, they should take care of it, but that we're all responsible. We are all required to come up with some way to help solve this crisis in our corporate ways, in our law firm ways, in our festival ways, or in our envi environmentally cor uh, correct ways. Um, and again, in the, and, you know, I think you, the, the UN and UNESCO are doing an amazing job and that's, you know, you, you, set, you set the standard for the rest of us. It's too much to ask, but uh, we are trying to do our, our part of the, of the job because we need all the support of the whole ecosystems. Um, right now, we decided to choose one question, but it, from the many that we received, there was a lot of questions that are in the same line. So I will ask you and please free Willie to respond, whoever wants. Uh, the, the question is the following. While it's already hard for established artists to continue working under lockdown, what can be done to help young emerging, em emerging artists? Somebody wants to answer, please. Rose. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes back to you know, governmental policies and how they are implemented. And, you know, many of us have been looking back to the uh, work projects administration after the depression where jobs were created and funded by governmental sources. We also have, you know, corporations that could help, but I think the only way that we're going to be able to develop a sustainable system to enable young artists to develop is a, to have higher level corporate and uh, philanthropic support for new ventures and B have the public accept the fact, at least in, in rich countries, rich parts of the countries like ours, that there is an economic cost that goes along with, um, you know, enabling talent in that way. Sean? I also think, I also think the virtual oh. is very conducive for emerging artists to launch themselves into, into the world and um, really share their art and be discovered. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity for emerging artists. Um, I think from the economics perspective, that is always going to, that is a challenge that we have to think more about. And um, there are, there's fiscal sponsorship that's still around. So there, there are programs that before COVID and, and I think after COVID that need to still be refined. Yeah, I think there's, Sorry. there's a, there are a few different things. Um, you know, we've done some philanthropic giving in that way. We're going to do some more um, where we do some commissioning programs. Um, we've, uh, uh, as part of one of our imprints, Samuel French has had the Off Off Broadway Festival for years that takes in some submissions of 10 minute plays and normally performs them live. Obviously we have to do a, a virtual version this year, which is not the same, but um, some of those playwrights have gone on to become uh, successful ones that we've continued to work with. And so finding that talent, whether it's a sponsorship of a, a high school fest level festival, not a specific school, but a or college level festival. Um, but you know, the, the internet has helped uh, in that respect if they have access to it. That um, I know from having worked for a couple of large music companies um, that they have teams of people scouring YouTube and uh, self submitted things on uh, streaming services looking for the next talent. Um, and they cast a wide net. Um, so if, if you're very talented and you can figure out a way to present yourself in this way, when everyone is presenting themselves in this way, um, you know, you have probably more direct access to, uh, people who can help you, uh, as, as either put it, put your work into a larger channel or something else. I mean, it's true right now, it doesn't matter what level of artistic achievement you're at. Um, no one is getting an awful lot of income at the moment because of 
the current situation. So there is certainly, it's, it's never been easy um, and it's harder now, but uh, getting attention now, um, you know, when people are scrolling their social media all the time or looking for things on YouTube, um, you know, you may have, an op a young artist may have an opportunity there. I think creating the, um, the ongoing mechanism for that is the challenge. I think it's a, it's a funding issue and it's a, it's also, uh, once the, 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 the channel of that is created, it's also um, building awareness of what that channel would be so that people know where to go to take advantage of it. Not just about money, but about access. Emily, you want to close? Yeah, I'll just say, I, I think, you know, it definitely depends on the medium as a, as a, uh, someone who graduated film school and found myself, you know, looking for work, how do I, how do I, you know, um, be take the next step in, in my journey, I can certainly relate to that dilemma. I think though that an advantage is, um, that people have more time on their hands right now. And there are actually way more networking opportunities um, and people who have the capacity to, you know, there's, there's no longer sort of these physical barriers impeding you from, you know, getting on a, you know, a Zoom conversation or whatever it might be. So I think there's a lot more possibility for connection. We might actually forge connections that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to, um, you know, in a, in a pre-pandemic sense. So I would just like, especially in the filmmaking world, encourage young filmmakers to reach out and connect and find where those conversations are happening. Um, you know, whether it's through a, a local trade or, or uh, association, um, I'm seeing a lot of them pop up all the time, um, even to like small Facebook groups that exist that are, you know, specific to, to each industry. So there's a lot of ways to connect with fellow artists right now. And I think that's sort of the foundation to then, you know, launch your platform. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. That has been great. Uh, I, I wanted to, to thank, first of all, all the panelists for their insightful answers. The past 90 minutes have been truly enlightening in many ways. And we have learned a great deal about the re far reaching impact of COVID-19 on many levels on the cultural sector. The ideas shared during the Resilia discussion uh, normally are shared with the UNESCO and UN member states for consideration in the development of future policy for the creative uh, sectors. For those of you listening from around the world, I would like to invite you to start your own resilient movement using our comprehensive How to Guide available on UNESCO website. Once you complete your debate, please be sure to share the results of your debate with us so that UNESCO can share with the policymakers around the world. Leave no one behind. This was the promise we made when the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted in 2015 at the UN. Today, the COVID-19 crisis threatens this vision and artists and creators are in danger of being left behind. So this is why Resiliat, an artist-led movement where, where diverse artistic communities raise awareness on this issue is so essential more than ever. Every artist and creator affected by this uh, uh, pro protracted crisis matters, and they should never be left behind. Thanks to the effort of global leaders in the arts, culture, and organization, is starting to gain visibility within the pandemic response. The Culture 2030 Goal Coalition composed of eight international cultural networks recently released and signed a statement entitled ensuring culture fulfills its potential in responding to COVID-19 pandemic. This statement was recently endorsed by the president of the UN General Assembly, Mr. Tijani Mohamed Bande. It is a call not only to protect the creative industry, but also to use the power of arts and culture in crisis response. Culture does not have a dedicated SDG, as you know, the 17 SDGs. Rather, it is, rep it is present in every goal, from economic, social, to environmental objective. COVID-19 has shown this transversal power of creativity. Musicians have used songs to promote physical distancing and hand washing. Hand -washing. 
teachers have used creative content to engage their student online. In other words, human-centric development needs cultural perspective. And these voices, shared by hundreds of artists and creators and, and, and managers during Resilia debates, will not go unheard. Our report on today's UN75 Resilia Dialogue will be included in the UN75 report, which will be shared with heads of state, governments, and, <clears throat> sorry, and UN leaderships during the UN75th uh, anniversary commemoration this September. The cultural sector must unite in the face of this unprecedented crisis to work in greater partnership to help the build back better and to create the future that we want. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the four panelists that we heard today. It has been a great pleasure. And also to our new partner, UN75 and United Nations Chamber Music Society of the United Nations Staff Recreation Council for Organization for today's discussion. I will now like to invite to invite Ms. Brenda Von Gova, the founder of uh, the UNCMS, to give her closing remarks. And uh, her message will be followed by a performance by the two-time Grammy Award-winning composer Christopher Tin. Greetings. My name is Brenda Von Gova, president of the UN Chamber Music Society. Thank you for joining our discussion today on how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the music and film industries and how these industries are responding. We would like to thank the UN Secretary General's advisor on UN75, Fabrizio Hochschild, and WHO's Art and Health Lead, Christopher Bailey, for opening this special discussion. I'd also like to thank all of the panelists for their invaluable insights. And above all, we would like to thank Ernesto Otone, UNESCO's Assistant Director General for Culture for moderating this panel discussion. Art and culture are severely underrepresented in global policy discussions. The UN Chamber Music Society will prepare a summary of today's dialogue, which will be included in the UN 75 report that will be presented to world leaders of 193 member states, as well as UN leadership at the commemoration of the UN 75th anniversary in the General Assembly this September. UNCMS has also endorsed the Culture 2030 Goal Statement entitled Ensuring Culture Fulfills Its Potential in Responding to the COVID-19 Pandemic. The Statement Advocacy Campaign was launched by eight international cultural networks this April and was endorsed earlier this month by the President of the UN General Assembly, His Excellency Mr. Tijani Mohamed Bande. We call on the cultural sectors to unite to protect the creative industries including music and film, that will help us rebuild our societies better and create the future we want. We call on you to make your voice heard. Engage with UN75 and Resilient Arts. Endorse the Culture 2030 Goal Statement. Music and film help us find meaning and purpose through historic and artistic reflection. We will need the creative and intellectual capacities they foster more than ever once this crisis has passed. And on that note, I hope that you will enjoy this closing performance of Baba Yetu by two-time Grammy Award-winning composer, Christopher Tin. I thank you. <laughs>